ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sant Director, National Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian, Kirk Johnson. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, a fabulous day to start this thing off. And I run a large natural history museum, in fact, the world's largest natural history museum. And what we do is we create new knowledge by doing basic scientific research. And we preserve those objects in this incredible collection, 145 million objects in the Natural History Museum. And then we communicate with huge audiences. We see about 7 million people in the building every year. Which means, for us, it's not just a year-to-year -year thing. It's just that, if you think about it, 80% of those visitors actually are one-time tourists to Washington, D.C. So the next year, it's a different 6 million people. And over a decade, we'll see 60 million people in the building. And we know from watching kids come into the building, it is kids that really love natural history museums, that they are struck by the awe and beauty and wonder of it. And I've talked to many scientists who have said, I became a scientist because I walked into Museum X and saw Object Y. It's that inspiration. So for me, it's a lot about inspiration. What triggers things to start thinking about change? And we are facing what is, for sure, the most challenging 30 years of human history in the next 30 years, which is kind of nuts, because I've been a scientist for 35 years, and I think back 35 years, and that went in a blink. So the next 30 years is going to go to blink as well. And we have to do what we're doing now, but do it better and more effectively. And that's what this session is about. It's about how we can actually help people and inspire people to see an optimistic outcome, a world where we have a stabilized population, and we've got an energy system that's sustainable in the future. So a post-carbon, sustainable population, sometime in the next 50, 60 years, and then move forward to the second set of questions for the 22nd century. And those kids that are coming to museums now will be alive in the 22nd century. So this is an immediate problem. It's not an off in the future problem. And for a paleontologist, I kind of like it because it's happening right now and the next 30 years really matter. So we've got four great speakers. The first one is Nancy Knowlton, the Sant Ocean Chair at the National Museum of Natural History. And she'll talk to you about optimism. Go, Nancy. and welcome to the Earth Optimism Summit. We've had a slight change in the program for this session because thanks to an airline that will go unnamed, uh, two of our speakers are stranded in Toronto. Uh, we took a little time from the lateness of the introductory session, but fortunately one of the speakers is a woman named Ellen Kelsey. And we have worked so closely together for the last decade that I'm gonna essentially tell her story, which is also my story. But I'd like to begin by showing a video that she sent us this morning. It's been a little crazy trying to, you know, needless to say, I got about four hours sleep as it was, and then I woke up realizing I was gonna have to give a talk that I wasn't planning on. So uh, bear with us a little bit, but this is a really lovely video that gives you a sense of what Ellen Kelsey is like as a person, sort of just a bit of Ellen Kelsey, even though she's physically not here. I have to say she's the most, uh, irrepressibly optimistic person I've ever met, but even she could not get a, well, not one, but not two, but three different planes that taxied onto the runway and turned back. She could not lift them into the air. So here she is on the screen, and then I'll say a few words afterwards. My name is Ellen Kelsey and I teach in the Masters of Environmental Education and Communications program at Royal Roads University in Canada and I also work on a research team at Stanford University and at James Cook University in Australia. Um, my project that I'm working on here at the Rachel Carson Centre is really looking at how do we move environmental narratives beyond doom and gloom towards more hopeful, resilient, um, more engaging, solutions-oriented approaches. For lots and lots of years, I've been involved in conservation projects and sustainability projects, a lot of them in the marine environment, and looking at ways that people engage with those kinds of issues. And one of the things that I've found in my work interviewing uh, children and interviewing conservation biologists and environmental educators is that there is a real um, strong emotional reaction to 
how we perceive the state of the planet. And that can be fear, it can be despair, it can be um, genuine anxiety, a feeling that things are really messed up. And that is proving through conservation psychology literature to be a real barrier to people's ability to, to enact a more sustainable future. So I, I guess what I'm realizing and, and what really drives me in my work is that we need to think about the narratives and the emotional implications of the stories that we tell about the state of the planet and be more creative and more open to alternative kinds of narratives that leave us feeling empowered and engaged and, and feeling like we really can enact the kind of futures that we're interested in having. So for example, um, really recent work on the idea that trees um, are not individual entities but are in fact part of social networks and that when a mother tree, some of the largest trees in the forest, when those mother trees are, are dying, they actually actively pass along their energy to the other components of their network, so to younger trees and other plants in the forest. In my most recent book, You Are Stardust, I really wanted to address this issue of uh, this sense of disconnection between children and the environment. And I wanted to do that by saying, you know, we really are just nature. Whether you're sitting in a car seat or you're sitting in the middle of a forest, you know, your hair falls like autumn leaves. When you exhale, you blow out pollen that may become a flower. You are intimately connected to nature. And those ideas of intimate connection are ones that astronomers are currently working with and we as environmental communicators are working with. One of the challenges in environmental humanities has been this kind of privileging of science so that we tend to think, oh, if we have a, an expert coming from a scientific viewpoint, they have more credibility or more weight in terms of their influence on environmental decision making. And what I think is really remarkable about the, the concept of the emotional landscape of environmental issues is that they are a perfect ground in which to look at the role of humanities because humanities helps us to understand the history that brought us to these feelings. It helps us to understand the social construction of our culture that reinforces those feelings. It helps us to understand the psychology underneath those feelings. And I think without that, we are destined to just keep replaying over and over again these stories of despair because we haven't critically analyzed why we feel the way we do. We just look at the evidence that supports how we feel uh, coming to us from uh, information about climate change or information about loss of species or any of these other very important science-based environmental issues. So for me, this field of emotions is the perfect place by which humanities and um, biological sciences come together in a very productive way to change the way we can live on this earth. Ellen from afar, we wish you were here. Um, I, I really like that video, uh, especially the part about the tree. It made me think I'm 67 years old and I'm trying to spread this positive energy. Hopefully I'm not dying quite yet, but I am sort of doing that kind of positive energy thing. Um, I knew, I've gotten to know Ellen really well because independently, and I think this is the way that most ideas happen. They're never just one person with a, one idea and no, no similar ideas anywhere on the planet. Usually ideas c happen because the conditions support and, and grow them, and so different people in different places have essentially the same idea. And I was, uh, I'm a coral reef biologist by training, and I um, saw a lot of really bad things happen right at the beginning of my career that all the reefs that I studied on the north coast of Jamaica essentially died within 10 years of my studying them. And I spent years sort of telling the story of how horrible things were on reefs and how they're getting worse and worse. And I used to teach a class uh, uh, with my husband, Jeremy Jackson, about um, marine biodiversity and conservation. And we'd start off the class in what seemed like a logical way, which was talking about the state of the ocean. But it turned out to be a really, really depressing way to start a class. And in fact, you could see it in the body language and the faces of all the students. They were, I could almost imagine these little bubbles over their heads saying, oh, why am I 
why am I going to go into conservation? It's so depressing. It's so hopeless. This is a big career mistake, and I've just written a check for $35,000 for this master's degree program, and I don't even like it. So I, we got this sense of, you know, this, that we weren't doing the right thing. And so uh, Jeremy and I actually started thinking about uh, the program we were running as medical school for the ocean. But if you think of it as medical school for the ocean, then you realize, well, you know, when you go to medical school, you don't, you're not trained to write obituaries of your patients, even though actually all your patients do wind up with an obituary. Um, you're, but we, what we were doing is running medical school for the ocean, and we were teaching our students to write ever more refined obituaries of, um, of the planet and the ocean in particular. And so Jeremy and I started running sessions called Beyond the Obituaries, and where we'd get together people just to talk about what was working. And that's, uh, that led to um, uh, Ellen finding me, because she was, for similar reasons, she was finding that anywhere between a quarter and a third of all children actually believe that the world is going to come to an end before they die. So, I mean, that's the level of environmental depression that exists in young people. So she called me up and said, you know, we need to do something about this. We're both trying to fight this negative, uh, this negative energy in the environmental movement. We need to start talking about what's working, because when we talk about what's working, you can see people getting energized and, and being inspired. And so we ran a very small workshop uh, with another woman, Helen Kelsey, I mean, Helen, Helen Coldaway, sorry. Um, Heather called away, and we brought about 14 almost random people, just people we could find that were nearby to talk about it. And, um, and we decided to launch a Twitter campaign as one of the outcomes of this small weekend workshop. And so we had a whole bunch of lists of um, different possible Twitter campaigns, uh, hashtags that we could use, and we voted. And the winner was hashtag Ocean Optimism. So we launched Hashtag Ocean Optimism in June of 2014, and it has since reached uh, over 76 million Twitter accounts. There was no PR money, no, there was nobody spent any money. It spread because of this hunger and this need to talk about what was working. And that's really the reason you're here today for an Earth Optimism Summit was really launched back then uh, talking about the ocean and success stories. So I just wanted to share that, that little piece of history as to how this Earth Optimism Summit came to pass. And I think what I'm going to do now is cede the stage to the next speaker so we have plenty of time for uh, discussion. But um, there you have it. There's a little in your um, bag is a little um, sheet with two essays that I was involved in, one in science and one in nature, gives a little bit more of the rationale for the Earth Optimism Summit. But I thought I'd share, since I had to speak for Ellen, I would share our joint history. Uh, thank you for coming. Thanks, Nancy. Our next speaker is Brett Jenks from RARE. Thank you very much. It's, it's great to be here, and I too am an Earth optimist. I love uh, the idea. I didn't know it started with ocean optimism, but I, um, I salute you and I salute the Smithsonian for putting on this fantastic event. So, technically speaking, we know exactly what we all must do in order to preserve the planet. We need to change what we eat. We need to change the way we manage landscapes. We need to change the way we heat our homes, change the way we cool our offices. There's a lot that we need to change. Conservation's about people. We must change the way we behave in order to preserve and sustain our planet. That we all know. The challenge is how to make that change come about. How do we communicate that? How do we inspire people? One thing's for sure. It's a, there's a good reason why companies don't put their engineering departments in charge of product marketing. Imagine if the chemists who created Viagra were in charge of their own marketing campaigns. The ad itself would probably look like a horrible side effect. <laughs> but then imagine in the hands of a creative, local, can-do conservation organization, an ad to debunk the myth of nature's Viagra sea turtle eggs. Well, imagine what you could do if you were very creative and you thought very clearly about your target audience and the kind of behavior that you wanted to change. 
Technically speaking, there are lots of reasons not to eat turtle eggs. They're high in cholesterol, it's illegal, they're really important for ecotourism, uh, and of course, there's really no proof that there's any aphrodisiac qualities whatsoever. So, technically speaking, we know why we shouldn't eat turtle eggs. But speaking technically would never be as good as an ad like this one, produced by Wild Coast. Some of you may have seen this. Translation, my man doesn't need sea turtle eggs because he knows they don't make him more potent. Communication and conservation is critical, but we must even move beyond commu great communications. We must move to human behavior change. One of the best inspirers of community behavior change I've met in my entire life is this man. Paul Butler. He's one of my best friends. He's an inspiring conservation leader. Many of you already know the story of Paul. Uh, it's somewhat legendary now. Working in the late 1970s into the 80s and early 90s in his home island of St. Lucia, Paul was working to save this particularly endangered species, um, which sat right on the verge of extinction as of the early 1980s. So imperiled was this bird, in fact, that the IUCN and the World Wildlife Fund said, this bird cannot escape oblivion by the year uh, 2000. So Paul famously crafted his own local campaign with almost no budget, and his goal was to inspire a sense of civic pride in the environment, to inspire people to feel a sense of identity, cultural heritage, and link that pride to the conservation of this endemic bird, take pride in St. Lucia. Well, he created a local mascot uh, with his, this kitschy mascot uh, you see there. He named him Jaco. In fact, they even created a local song. Uh, the song, great title for a song, it's the Latin name of the bird, Amazona Versicolor. Of course, that's what you would call uh, your, your, your pop hit for conservation. 20 years later, I took Rare's board of directors to St. Lucia to see what had actually happened over those years. And in the customs line, a local customs official, this wonderful lady, when, when asked, said, of course I remember that song, man. Amazona Versicolor, a Jaco found only in St. Lucia. She had learned that as a school child, you know, potentially in this classroom with Paul many years later. So Paul was able to inspire this sense of pride. Eventually, Jaco got his own tour bus on an island that's only 16 miles wide, and he toured, and he toured, and eventually this icon became a symbol of national pride. Public referendum landed it on the passport. It is the symbol of St. Lucia, a bird that could have easily gone extinct. Here's what the numbers look like today. There's more than 1,800 St. Lucian parrots in the wild. And without this pride campaign, it's very likely this bird would be extinct. This is one of my favorite bright spots, as we call them. Uh, it stood the test of time. We just were, were back again after uh, about 35 years with our board of directors, just last month, and the program has stuck. St. Lucia is a different country as a result, thanks to this guy, Paul Butler. Well, the Smithsonian discovered Paul in about 1994 and put this campaign in Belize right on the cover of the magazine. This is about the time I joined Rare, and together we committed ourselves, Paul and I, to spreading this idea of conservation pride worldwide. And that's really what we've spent a lot of time doing in recent years. Today, there have been more than 350 different pride campaigns in more than 50 countries around the world. Each one of those, a little source, I would say, of Earth optimism. That's a lot of work rolling out 350 campaigns, training 350 Paul Butler clones to roll out with similar approaches. But while we were doing this, two guys much smarter than the two of us we're working on an entirely different strategy. Two psychologists, one who won the Nobel Prize, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, were working on changing the way people think about how people think. And in their increasingly famous body of work, they began to identify a number of insights into how humans behave, how, why we make the decisions that we do, how, how essentially illogical irrational and emotional human beings really are. We're not homo economicus, we're homo sapiens. And we know a few things, but we're often confused 
about just what we know. So we started asking ourselves recently, what if we could harness these behavioral insights for conservation? We're sort of the go-to group for behavior change at the grassroots level in conservation, but even we haven't begun to harness these insights from neuroscience and social psychology and behavioral economics, evolutionary biology. There's so much out there to learn. There's so many new insights that we can tap and bring to the conservation space, bring to all of our peers around the world. So that's precisely what we've begun to do. In order to begin to think about how to teach these insights, we've started off with a, a, a researcher at Harvard named Erez Yelly. And with Erez, we've started to model out just a, a handful of these initial insights to begin to tinker with just how they might apply. So bear with me while we, I walk you through just, just a handful uh, of these initial insights. In order to do this, let me introduce you to Roger. Roger is the blue man in the center of the screen. And Roger has to make a decision. Is he going to water this tree or is he going to cut it down? Let's assume one is a good behavior and one is a bad behavior. And the question for us as conservationists is, how do we increase the likelihood that Roger and all of his friends are going to choose the right behavior, that they're going to behave well? Now, we know that nobody makes a decision in a vacuum. Roger has friends. Roger has associates. Roger lives in a society. And there are a number of insights based on the fact that Roger's likely to make a decision based on how he thinks his friends or those from whom he seeks approbation are going to respond. How are they going to judge his decision? That's what society is essentially about in our human interactions every day. So five quick insights. One of them is, if nobody can see what decision Roger eventually makes, well, then all that reputational risk doesn't come into play. And it's less than likely that Roger's going to do the right thing. So it's really important to make behaviors observable. I just begin to imagine the many applications of just that one idea, whether they be technological or, or otherwise. But make behaviors observable. That's really key. A second insight has to do with the fact that if no one knows there's a right way or a wrong way, if there's no norm, well, then it's less than likely that Roger's going to do the right thing. What's about the most important thing conservationists can do is establish a conservation ethic establish a norm around behaviors that will make this planet more sustainable. So it's important to establish norms. But it's really important to make sure that everybody knows there, in fact, is a norm. So you can't just expect people to behave uh, in a particular way. We need to be thinking about how to make those norms commonly held. Shared beliefs are really powerful, especially if we know we share them. A fourth insight has to do with just the nature of the behavior we're trying to change. Binary behaviors, yes, no, on, off, more explicit behaviors, more explicit requests are much more effective than, for example, eat more vegetables, use less gas, turn down the thermostat. It's so much more powerful to be explicit. Don't eat red meat. Do get 35 miles to the gallon. Set your thermostat at X. Those are far easier behaviors uh, to, for us to adopt. Lastly, and there are many, many, many of these insights that we can all tap into, but just to round out this, this first handful, it's really important to make these behaviors um, easy. People generally like to do things that are easy, and they will go out of their way to avoid, avoid things that are difficult. It's all super common knowledge, really basic insights. But we've only been at this a little while. We're just beginning to scratch the surface. But we are committed to building a global network of conservationists, behavioral economics, economists, social psychologists, to begin to bring together the best of these insights and to share them with conservationists the world over. That's precisely our plan. If we want to create a sustainable planet, we also need to change the behavior of conservationists. And I think in many ways, that's what this Earth Optimism Summit is about. We need to do two things. First, we need to spend a lot more time in conservation thinking about the fact that, at the end of the day, conservation is about people, and we need to become agents of human behavior change. We need to study the, the light arts of human behavior change. And second, we need to spend a lot more time looking outside of our organizations, outside of our countries, 
looking outside ourselves to find what's already working out there. So let me give you an example of how these two factors come into play. With, um, with the example of uh, our good friend Kathy de Mesa from Tinnenbach. Kathy is a local conservationist. She was born and bred in the village of Tinnenbach on the coast of the Philippines. And as many of you know, the Philippines has a major challenge with overfishing. It has become a national concern. For Kathy, it's also personal. Her father's a fisherman. Her grandfather was a fisherman. Her son will likely be a fisherman. So it's not really an option for the community of Tinnenbach to lose its coastal fisheries. But it is definitely uh, a possibility. Coastal fisheries around the world are, have, have been overexploited for decades. We've seen a multi-generational decline in coastal fish populations. This is a conservation challenge on the verge of becoming a humanitarian crisis. So clearly something needs to be done. In order to figure out how to help Kathy, we looked around the world and asked ourselves, where are the bright spots in reducing coastal overfishing? So to, to look for bright spots, we actually created an online prize competition. We call it Solution Search. And the idea is to crowdsource those emerging best ideas for reducing overfishing and restoring coastal, uh, coastal fisheries in countries like the Philippines. In just two months, we received 103 entries from more than 48 countries. And what we learned from those experiences, we brought to an emerging partnership that we were developing at the time with Environmental Defense Fund, University of California, Santa Barbara, and the government of a host of, of different nations. Those bright spots delivered through pride campaigns uh, in these countries have given us another sense of optimism about the ocean. Right now around the world, there are hundreds of local leaders just like Kathy applying that bundle of insights using behavior change, inspiring communities to restore, for the first time in decades, their coastal fisheries. Another great uh, source of Earth optimism. So this is what it looks like on the ground. Kathy leveraging these insights, harnessing the force of human behavior change and local pride. First, making behaviors good and bad much more observable. Second, thinking about how to make sure that new norm becomes a norm for all of society. Children, uh, adults, mayors, ministers, people committing themselves publicly to protecting their coastal environment. That's the power of this campaign. And then finally, she's making sure every single person in the community knows exactly the challenge, the opportunity, the solution, and the progress that uh, she's making. Winning the hearts and minds of the people of Tinnenbach has led to a sustainable 50% increase in local fish populations just over the last three years. This bright spot in the Philippines has now been replicated, it's now being adopted by 90 coastal municipalities and counting. And thanks to Bloomberg Philanthropies, this particular approach in partnership with Oceana and Encourage Capital and the governments of several other countries is starting to spread a virtuous virus of coastal fishery recovery and proud local communities conserving nature. We're extremely proud of Kathy. But the final question is, how are we going to be able to harness these insights and bring them to bear in the many countries around the world, the tens of thousands of communities uh, that need similar assistance? And so we're committing ourselves over the next year to launching a global alliance of conservationists, behavioral economists, universities, social psychologists, neuroscientists, to begin to organize, share, distribute these behavioral insights for conservation. So the opportunity for, for those of you who are here today is if you're interested, feel free to join. We'd love to have you involved in this process, uh, this exploration, so that we can figure out how to bring these behavioral insights to the rest of the world. If you're interested, visit our website, rare.org. If you want to become part of the movement, if you'd like to really be involved, send an email to behaviorlab at rare.org, and you'll be signing up to receive updates on the new emerging insights coming from these fields that you can apply to your own work. Thank you to Smithsonian, and thanks very much for listening.
bright spots and pride campaigns. The next speaker is Afra Shah from Mumbai in India, who is dealing with the mother of all coastal plastic garbage piles. Afra. This. Hi, good morning to everybody, and a big hi to Washington, D.C. I'm so happy to be at Smithsonian. Um, let me tell you, I come from a city in India called Mumbai, where we are 20 million of us. A small city, uh, overcrowded at times, but there's a very peculiar problem in the ocean out there, you know. I have lived all my childhood there. I grew up in that city, and suddenly, uh, I realized three, four years back, uh, there was so much of plastic in my ocean there. I shifted to an apartment block, which is right on the sea. And I saw plastic and plastic and plastic, all your red, blues, whites on the sandy beach. It shook me, because as a child, I used to swim in that very sea. So the whole question which was uh, bogging my mind was, how did it happen? And if it has happened in this particular way, how do you deal with it? See, I'm a lawyer by profession. So I said, some people told me, uh, please file a petition to the High Court. Invite the Chief Justice to pass an order. Probably the court orders are going to be the cure for this problem of plastic. Maybe the local municipality will be summoned to the Chief Justice Court and made to answer why it has happened in the first place. The second option, which we all uh, use it, we keep on complaining. <laughs> we do that all the time. I see it on social media. I'm very new to social media, but we see that. Either we blame our uh, president for every wrong in the place, or I blame my prime minister, saying, Mr. Modi, you don't do enough. My ocean is in tatters. But the, the larger issue is, what are we doing about it? You see, you can look for systemic change, policy change, law change, legislative change. But I'm a strong believer, and I speak from my experience as a lawyer, the change has to come from within. It is the larger question is, what are you doing as a citizen of this planet Earth to rectify things? Are we in a position to turn the clock back what it was 50 years back, 70 years back, 100 years back? And I, 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 you know, my forefathers, I come from a country where my forefathers who fought the independence for my country taught me that the problem is with you and the solution is with you. Mahatma Gandhi, who fought for my independence, did not wait for an army to come from abroad to fight his battle. He took the charge himself. He said, here it is the problem. Like I remember, you know, one of the acts uh, was uh, regarding salt. The government, the British government that time had imposed a tax on salt. Ta uh, salt is so basic. Mahatma Gandhi didn't file a petition to the court. He went to the salt creek, picked up the salt, and, say, and told the British, come on, arrest me if you want to. I want to have my salt, this is my country. And that's exactly what was going on in my mind. I told myself, as a lawyer, should I go to the high court and invite the chief justice? Or should I complain on the social media and invite the attention of the world, there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem? Or, sh or should I do what I thought I was very competent to handle, is wear your gloves and go on the beach? It's my planet, it's my neighborhood, it's my beach, it's my ocean. What am I waiting for? Am I waiting for the government to pass laws? Am I waiting for policies to be framed up? Am I waiting for a ban on single-use plastic? Or I do something positive? I chose the hard way. See, I have been cleaning the beach for now for 81 weeks. It's a very hard, tough journey. It's a laborious job, but that's the right path, according to me. That's the, that's the path I chose to go on. It was a hard, tough decision to make. I pondered it over for a month or two, saying that if I start it, I shouldn't stop it. You see, people do all these activities. You, 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 you are well aware on Facebook and Twitter and whatever. They do it as more as like an event, you know? So you do one off event of cleaning, and then you vanish off. Maybe you come back after six months back again, and then you talk about the problem. I said, no. If I'm making a conscious choice of going with the gloves on the beach, I should do it consistently, persistently, and sincerely. And I told myself this question, that if I do it, it has to be till death do us apart or till the ocean is free of plastic. It can't be, I mean, because you see, it's the easier path is to tell the government, come on, do it, come on, do it. <laughs> tell, your, 
tell your legislator, tell your congressman, you know, member of parliament, frame laws, frame laws, enforce it. And I realized being a lawyer, you see, my country has so many laws, so many laws, you'll get caught. And lawyers are good at it, you know. They take you around at the courts at times. And uh, I realized that there are too many laws, too many rules, too many regulations, no ground action at all. You know, my city has 20 million people, and there's absolutely zero ground action. We have what we call slums in Mumbai, you know, where the poorest of poor are living on the creeks and on the coastal belt. Everybody's littering. Your single-use plastic, which comes from the mall, from the shop, just goes into the ocean. There is no STP, the sewage treatment plant, so everything is going into the ocean. So I said to myself, I should take it on myself and do it. And I knew the journey is going to be tough because not a single person can solve it. I'm no King Canute that I can tell, uh, tell the ocean not to come in. Every high tide, it brings the gifts onto the beach, you know. <laughs> and uh, the video which I'm going to play, you'll have a fair uh, look at it. I'll show you the video, and then I continue my chat, because you must understand what kind of work I'm doing. And then I'll take you on why I call it a date with an ocean. I made a short movie, which I'm, I've labeled it as a date with ocean. But let me add three caveats to it uh, before you see the movie, because I don't know whether your country has seen it or not. Uh, it's a very shocking and disturbing sight, OK? But then uh, it's the rea ground reality. G oceans all over the world are suffering this syndrome. You know? They are devastated by human beings. Second, it is not a bundle of statistics. It's pure flow of emotion. You know? I feel very intensely about ocean. I love it. You know when you're in love, what do you do? There's a surge of emotion all the time. So for me, it's a surge of emotion all the time. So the movie is going to depict that. And the third is, the idea to show you a movie in a, in a right, uh, when I'm talking about it, is for you to think, act, and get provoked eventually. Can we have the movie, please? Just have a look at the movie, and then I come back for a talk back again. This is Mumbai. This is where I was born. This is where I lived all my life. I don't know if I could ever have imagined any life other than this. It's a fascinating world to live in Mumbai, a metro where people from different religious backgrounds. I love Mumbai and I want to see the coasts of Mumbai and the oceans of Mumbai and of India and of the world relegated back to where it belonged free of plastic. And I want to see my ocean healthy. I want to see my marine species and birds healthy. I have lived all my life on the coast of Mumbai and particularly very adjacent to Warsaw Beach. And I remember when I was a kid, I used to come with my friends to play in this very beach. This is the consequential effect of convenience in economic prosperity. When I look back, I see only plastic. Plastic and plastic and plastic in my ocean. And what you see now is a tragic devastation. It's symbolic of the era which we live in. We have devastated our oceans. We have devastated the lives of the species which live in the ocean. And we have no right to do that. My right must come to an end where the rights of the other species begin. I must stop there. But I have not stopped. I have continued, I have continued. I have invaded their houses. I have invaded their food habits. And I still remember my first day when I went to Jetty just to do a recce there. I actually sat there and cried that morning. I said to myself, I don't know how long is going to be the journey. I don't know whether I'll be able to do it. Because I was alone at that point of time. But I knew for a fact that I had to make a start. I need to bond with my environment. And that's the time I realized that I had snapped my ties with the ocean, you know. I couldn't even put my hand in that water. Then I decided I'm going to make an effort to build my personal bond with the ocean. And consequently, if I'm able to provoke people around me who can come and do the same exercise which I wanted to do, that'll be wonderful. And that's how the journey started. I remember my first day, I picked up five bags full of plastic. In my country, we have 1.5 billion people. Imagine if two hands come on the beach, or come on the ocean front, or come on the river body, wherever they are, the water, lakes. My country can become clean faster. In fact, the world can become clean. To my mind, it's always a date with the ocean. So when you're on a date, you, you are physically, mentally at your best. You look forward not only for that evening or that morning or that afternoon, for many more to come until death do us apart.
It's almost one and a half year we have been cleaning. United Nations has labeled it as the biggest beach cleanup in the world. We have picked out around five million kgs of plastic and filth from our ocean. I'm not going to complain to my government. I'm not going to complain to my judiciary. I'm not going to complain to anybody. My cry is inside my heart and I don't have any complaints with anybody. It's me, it's me, it's me. We are in the 76th week of our journey of cleaning the beaches and ocean. A lot of people ask me, how long are you going to clean? This question is flawed because not many people clean the ocean. This plastic will go into the deep sea, never to come back. Me and my volunteers will keep on doing it. Maybe this beach will become clean soon, but there are many other beaches which are in equally bad shape as Warsaw Beach was. We will continue our efforts on other beaches. It's about all of us. It's inclusive and it will continue that way till our oceans are made plastic free. This is what the scene in Mumbai is. And let me tell you, it's a global phenomenon, the marine litter problem. I mean, just Google it, you'll know. I am not giving any statistics. It's all there on the internet. Just Google marine litter problem. I'm here to convey a message for myself and for everybody who's hearing me and everybody who's in this hall and will eventually watch this. We owe it as a fundamental duty to our ocean, you know. We have waited far too long for our governments to act. We have waited far too long for our politicians to act. And even in spite of laws and acts being in place, we have not done enough. There's a major problem with enforcement you know, on the ground level. There's no enforcement mechanism, especially in uh, developing countries you know, where people are struggling for their food and basic necessities. And we'll have to go there and help and provoke people of doing that. You see, as a lawyer, I understand we hold our planet as a, it's, it's what I call it, an intergenerational equity. You know? We hold our planet for a future generation. It's an environmental justice which we must do, and it begins from being responsible. How do you stop marine litter? First of all, make your house zero garbage. And if, if, if others are throwing it, you try to clean your ocean or beach. That's the best preventive action you can do. You see, we live our life of right of, it's, our life is all about convenience. Single-use plastic bags, which I find majorly on my beaches, it's all convenience. You have a right to convenient life, and you have right of the ocean and right of the marine species and birds, we'll have to draw some kind of balance. The balance at this point of time is tilted heavily in favor of our, of our human race. You know? we, we all the time want convenient. We'll have to tilt this balance up. How do you tilt this balance up? One is go and clean. We all are responsible for this marine litter. All over the world, the oceans, uh, the beaches are grappling with it. And the second aspect is we are born creative, which I, you know, which I strongly believe as a lawyer, as a, now clean, working as an environmentalist to clean the beach. We are creative and we are fearless. We are born with that. But the system around us tells us become a little mundane, a uh, little simpler, you know. I feel that if we, f if, if we flash our creativity in a proper way and channel it properly, the results could be this. You know, I have more than 2,000 volunteers working in Mumbai from different backgrounds, uh, different religions. Some are Catholic, some are Muslim, some are Hindu. Lawyers, doctors, housewives, school kids, you know. The idea is, I always tell people, I give two hours in a week, not much to, you know, look forward to. We have 168 hours, if you give two hours, you're born with the environment, you're born with the ocean. And my message generally is, that get, in, get into mode with, as, a, as you go on a date, you know. When, you go, when you're looking forward to something, you go on a date with ocean, things fall in place. I have provoked a lot of small kids who are uh, below age who are on date with ocean. <laughs> and now my idea is to provoke more adults who can go on date with an ocean, you know. I keep on talking in Mumbai about it. We do ground action. And I think it's high time we human beings react to it positively and take it in a hand. And people ask me, for how long you'll do it, what is the issue, how it will get solved. I mean, clean your 10 by 10, I expect. You know, I'm not here to become a saint. A lot of people tell me, oh God, you're doing a great job. I don't want it. I'm selfish, I'm purely selfish. And the selfish needs come from the fact that I want to do something for my planet. And I tell people up, you know, if it becomes your selfish need, maybe our planet will be much more better and, you know, our oceans are going to be fitter and healthier. 
Uh, thank you very much for inviting me over. I think I'm running out of the time. The guys are indicating to me. I would have loved to talk a little longer. You know, being a lawyer, we talk a lot. So, uh, uh, but I guess uh, my time is up. Thank you for bearing with me. And I hope uh, my video and my little chat has provoked you on going on a date with the ocean. And uh, since I'm in Washington, D.C., I was speaking to some local guys here. And I said, uh, if, given a, if given a choice whether to speak here at Smithsonian or clean the river Potomac, I'm told it's a little dirty, I would be there and I would be inviting all of you all to there. <laughs> but I'll do that on this Saturday. I intend to take three hours. So anybody who's from Washington, D.C. who wants to join in the cleanup, let's do a little cleanup of Potomac River here in Washington. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. It's awesome, man. That was awesome. So our next and last speaker is Randy Olson, who's been giving scientists hell for a long time. And his title is Narrative is Leadership. Thanks very much, Kirk. And yeah, I'm here to talk about one thing only, which is uh, narrative is leadership. And I'm going to start with a couple of short uh, case studies. This is all material that derives from a book that uh, I published a couple years ago titled Houston, We Have a Narrative, um, why science and pretty much everybody needs a deeper grasp of these simple narrative principles. So I think we'd all agree that this fellow is a noble environmentalist. He's dedicated a lot of time and energy to environmental causes. Uh, but there's a problem. He's made two documentary feature films. And the first one was reviewed by Roger Ebert, who said this movie, despite its noble intentions, is a bore. The second one was reviewed last year in The Hollywood Reporter, which said this noble rehash of things who, already, um, who everyone who cares already knows. And the problem here is a failure to tap into the dynamics of a clicker, um, the dynamics of, of narrative. So narrative activates the brain, it motivates the body, and it unifies people. Um, it's, th these films, unfortunately, like so many environmental films, are, follow the template that I call and, 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 which is simply the presentation of information. Here's an issue, and here's another issue, and here's another issue. Narrative involves three forces, agreement, contradiction, and consequence. These three forces are embodied in this template of and, but, and therefore that we call the ABT for the last six years I've been developing this. This is the centerpiece for the narrative training program called Story Circles that I now run, I'll talk about in a few minutes. So the second case study is the situation of a guy who has an actually very deep grasp of the power of narrative. And this begins with the template for the telling of a story as described by the anthropologist Joseph Campbell in the last century. And what he said is that a story is basically a circular journey that begins in what he called the ordinary world. This is the place we all yearn to live our lives of total comfort, no conflict, everything is wonderful, there's no problems. When a problem arises, we then transit into what he called the special world. This is the narrative part of a story. And you then head off on this journey and search for the solution to the problem. Now, one of the key characteristics is as soon as you enter into this narrative world, uh, the special world, um, all you really want is just to find your way back home to that ordinary world, the place of comfort again. Think about the Wizard of Oz. This is when Dorothy lands in Oz. All she is ex as exciting and fun, colorful as Oz may be, deep inside, all she really wants is just to get back to that comfortable, ordinary world. Now, about a year and a half ago, I found myself repeating this phrase over and over and landing on that last word there um, and thinking to myself, where was I hearing a slogan which also had that as the last word in the slogan? And I think we all know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> And sadly, there is nothing the least bit funny about this slogan. The tragedy is what happened with the journalists in this country. They failed to analyze this from a narrative perspective. This guy was tapping into 4,000 years of narrative, basically evolution of the brain. These are principles that go all the way back to Gilgamesh. And he was singing a song, not for the intellectuals, but for the masses in our society. And it's a very effective song that he's continu continuing to sing now. So when I hit this moment of re realization, um, I got very concerned. Now, why did I find this? Why is this a concern? Well, it's because we now live in the information society. It's a different world today than even five and 10 and 15 years ago. And again, I fail to see journalists really looking at this com these communication dynamics from this perspective. 
So communication consists of two fundamental parts. Uh, there is the content of what you want to communicate, which is the inf information, the substance, and then there's the form, how it's put together, and that's what those uh, templates of the and, but, therefore, and AAA are. Uh, when I was a kid, there wasn't that much information in our society. It was possible for lots of people to digest uh, information, and accuracy and honesty really were important criteria. But we're in a different world now. There is this fire hose of information screaming at us. The world of science and technology is responsible for creating it. And as a result, the masses, everybody's pretty much forced now to shift from that idea of analyzing each piece of information into looking for these higher levels of organization, and that's what narratives are. And the result is we now live in a more narrative environment in terms of the criteria of how to analyze communication. So that's the concern, and furthermore, we live in also, it's, you know, you constantly hear we live in a media society, and media is narrative. The mainstream media will not let, let you in there unless what you're communicating has a high degree of narrative content, is rich in that ABT. You can't get out there with the and, and, and thing, expect much time. So has anybody warned us about what the consequences of this might be? Yes, absolutely, and this is one guy in particular. Uh, Michael Crichton, the science fiction writer who wrote Jurassic Park and passed away in 2008, and in 1999, he gave a tremendous speech, the keynote address at the AAAS meeting. It's, you can find it online to this day. And among many things, that speech was a blueprint for how to deal with the anti-science movement that emerged over the next decade. Sadly, the science world appears to have taken virtually no advice from him. There's all these specific recommendations in there that don't seem to have ever been listened to or implemented. Uh, but there's a couple quotes from it that I want to share with you that I think are very profound and, and impressive. So the first of which is, is this. He said toward the beginning of the, the uh, speech, the information society will be dominated by those who are most skilled at manipulating the media. Um, if he were alive today, I don't think he'd be the least bit surprised by who got elected president. That's at the core of what's going on now in this world of too much information. And then here's a rather unsettling second quote, which I totally agree with. He said towards the end of his speech, scientists don't understand media. For 25 years, I've been trying to work with scientists on media. They fundamentally do not understand media. Now, why might that be? What I would suggest is I think there's a major developmental element possibly that goes with this. Um, it's only the last decade that neurophysiologists have come to realize that the brain doesn't complete its development until age 25. It's still growing neurons. It's still going through what's called synaptic shaping, other things like that. Um, and yet scientists begin their education in their teens. By freshman year, 18 years old, scientists are already headed down this developmental pathway, I think, where they're bombarding their brain, incubating it in this soup of information that is non-narrative. It's very different from other students that are going down the humanities pathway and reading hundreds of novels in a far more narrative environment. Um, there seems to me there have to be developmental consequences of that. that lo the frontal lobes, the last part of the brain development, is going on in this intensely informational, non-narrative world. Um, I don't know of any research that's been done on this so far. However, I do know about one brain transplant experiment that took place. There was a guy who incubated his brain for 20 years in that science world, the non-narrative informational science world, and then at age 38 transplanted his brain to the intensely narrative world of Hollywood, and that guy, of course, is me. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I have been living in Hollywood for more than 20 years now, and the good news is I've gotten a lot better at narrative. Um, good enough that I've written three books about it, now run this narrative training program. Uh, and yet, I can tell that I will never get as deep of narrative intuition as some of the major screenwriters that I've met there who can tell these very complex stories and just have it down at a much deeper level. And I really think that there's a developmental limitation. I let my brain develop in that non-narrative world for, to such a point that I don't think I could ever circle back around. This stuff is very slow to change. So going back to that, um, that slogan, as soon as I hit that, that realization, it concerned me, my book was coming out, I wrote an editorial about this and teamed up with a publicist from University of Chicago Press with the book, and for eight months we tried to get it published, and we got turned away by everywhere from the New York Times, the 538 blog, all of them, most of them sending little comments about, you know, it's just not this simple. Well, it was that simple, and what I feared is exactly what happened. Um, and eventually, I mean, the, the thing that really disturbed me was it, 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 I could see this was a narrative mismatch. This guy was a heavyweight for narrative, and he was going up against an intellectual, um, a person who was very, very smart, but all of the media was already saying that her speeches were narratively flat. So finally, about a year ago, at the height of frustration, I sat down and searched on Google three words. Um, 
Hillary Clinton boring, and this was the first article that came up, honest to goodness. Um, and in an instant, I knew if there was any one guy in this country that would understand what I was talking about, it was James Carville, the guy who masterminded Bill Clinton's campaign in 1992, because he has this gift, this understanding for mass communication. I wrote him a letter, a friend of mine got it to him. The day that he got it, he called me up and he said, I've suspected for years there was a simple underpinning structure to storytelling like this and but therefore. Never heard it put this simply, but it makes sense to me. He set to work trying to get the Clinton campaign people to listen to me. They didn't listen to me any more than they listened to anybody. Um, so it was this long exercise and frustration for me. However, I got one consolation prize, which was in January of this year, he brought me to Tulane University to give a talk to his political science class, which meets one night a week in his living room there, 50 political science majors. It was one of the most fun nights of my entire life. Afterwards, we went out to dinner with he and his lawyer buddy, and I got two solid hours of the Raging Cajun telling me these incredible stories. And he is amazing. I wish the Democratic Party would listen to him because that's what they're missing are these narrative dynamics. And he's one of these guys who has deep narrative intuition. And the same thing with our president now. And this is at the core of the broad communication dynamics. So what can we do? Well. The problem we, we face now, as I say, is it's a new world. And you can think of this in terms of like natural selection. The, the environment has changed now, and it's now an intensely narrative environment, and there is intense selection for narrative content. And that ends up manifesting itself in who is going to succeed in these different things. As a result, I'm putting all my effort now into a program called Story Circles and Narrative Training, and working with my colleague, Jade Lovell, for the past two and a half years, we've been developing this, and it's, um, basically, a training program consists of five people getting together for one hour a week for 10 uh, sessions. And this is what a story circle looks like, just five people sitting in a room. It's very tightly structured, regimented in what you go through. There's no lectures, no note taking. It's simply giving people these templates like the ABT and material to analyze. And what it does is it activates the narrative part of their brain for the entire hour. Now, there are three things that we need for this to work. The first of which is the participants. Oh, and by the way, here's um, some of the, the people that we're now doing with some of the organizations. Um, there we go. Um, and so three main requirements. The participants have to be willing from the outset to admit they have a problem. It's just like rehab, you know? You can't start rehab till you admit you have a problem. And the good news is particularly the government agencies are coming to us and saying that before we even talk to them and say, we know we have a problem. We're not doing a good job getting our story out. We need to work on this stuff. So that's the starting point. Secondly, it's this word right here of training. And it's about repeated inculcation over time. The one-day workshops for communication need to end. You're fooling yourself if you think you're doing significant things in one day. And you're also sending out a message that this stuff is so simple, we can, you, know, you can make major strides in one day. Narrative is at the core of communication. It's very challenging. And that leads then to the third point, which is, much to our surprise, when Jade and I started coming up with this, we thought it was gonna be happy, fun, story circle sessions each week, social hour. Turns out it's pretty draining to spend an hour with your brain activated in the narrative part of the brain. And this is what comes back. Three weeks ago, I was at Genentech talking to the scientists running the circle there, and they're in their eighth week. He said, it's going great, we're getting so much out of it, but this stuff is like eating Brussels sprouts, um, which I hate, so that um, kind of, came home to me and yet I would eat Brussels sprouts if it made me better at narrative. So um, that's the tough part is that it really is hard work. Now narrative, I define in very simple terms in my book as the series of events that occur in the search for a solution to a problem. I'm sure this offends lots of humanities people but it's a very analytical definition that helps in terms, terms of trying to bring narrative to bear on problems that you're working on. So just to wrap up here, let's take a quick look at these two events that are happening this weekend. We have this three day summit and then we have the march happening tomorrow. Um, a year ago, I joined in with Nancy in helping her do a video for this event. And the reason I joined in is because she's had such a clear narrative on this from the very beginning. And using that amb but therefore template, it's about we've been celebrating Earth Day for over dec four decades and it's accomplishing great things, but it's focused mostly on the bad news, which can get draining. Therefore, it's time to focus on success stories, which will generate optimism. Now, in contrast, when you look at the march, um, it's happening tomorrow, and I'm a big fan of what they're doing, and I think it's really the right thing, but it doesn't have a narrative yet. And you can read all the articles that have kind of come at them. And the bottom line is this wonderful quote that I just wrote down this morning from my good friend Shirley Malcolm from AAAS. We were talking about this. 
And she basically said, this is simple terms. If you don't tell your story, someone else will. That's what's happened. Nobody else has told the story about this because the Earth Optimism Summit has had a, such a clear narrative. But all these articles about the march, they don't have a narrative yet. And as a result, you see all these articles that have kind of critiqued it. So the bottom line is this session is about inspiring positive action, which is extremely important. But what you have to know is that it's narrative that inspires positive action. I could sit here and give you positivity on and on, but if it's just that and, and, and template, I'm just gonna bore you and you're gonna get detached and you really won't get inspired. It's got to have that underpinning structure with it's built really around the problem solution dynamic. And that is what we face now, which is people that are in power are there because they've got this upper hand on the narrative and you're not gonna unseat them simply through fact checking or calling them liars or saying this is unfair. The only hope is to be launching competitive narratives. We're in this narrative landscape, and eventually, if you launch the right narratives, you'll start to pull people in that direction and move forward, and that, again, is why I'm such a fan of this event here. So that is the bottom line, is that we're in this world now where narrative is leadership. Thank you. Why don't you take them when we share? We'll invite the uh, panelists up for a speed panel. We have five minutes. <laughs> Sit back and enjoy. <laughs> what I'd like to do is ask each of the panelists just to make a, a final statement or a comment about someone else's talk, and we'll start with Brett. Great, terrific. So rule number one, never serve on a panel when you're giving a talk with an expert uh, willing to critique uh, your narrative. <laughs> so Randy, thank you. Look forward to all the tips afterwards. But I'll just say also, first of all, congratulations to Nancy for putting this whole thing together. This is bravo. Um, yeah. and, then, and then last, I just think your, your video uh, and the poem was just beautiful. So, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, trash has never looked so good, man. <laughs> How about you? Yeah, in fact, in Mumbai, they say that uh, it was called selfie. Now we call it Gabi. Gar so people <laughs> are clicking pictures of the garbage. It's quite fashionable now. In fact, a lot of uh, uh, movie stars, they do that these days. <laughs> Click pictures of the garbage and put it on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> so they say that at least Afros, Afros has made uh, garbage a little fashionable. Nice. <laughs> That's it. Did, did you have any thoughts about other, other talks? It was amazing. I think Randy's talk was superb, superb. I, I think I'll take a cue from you when I do a narrative now, because generally uh, I speak with passion and I'm very intense about it. So I just talk from ad, but I think I take a cue from him, you know, get the narrative right. Excellent. And uh, so was Nancy. Nancy was great, and so was him, yeah. That's good. And, and you kind of spilled your beans, but what about the other talks? <laughs> um, yeah, I think they all three exemplify this central challenge, which is humanizing these issues, and that's what all three of them have. Um, the, the turtle egg story, you know, I, I know <laughs> Faye Crevache who came up with that crazy campaign that, I, that I've used, and I've mentioned in my books and things, it's, it's so powerful, exactly, and just the personal element that you brought to your whole narrative mm -hmm. is, is extremely powerful. And same with, with her, the video. I'm glad we got at least to see the video of her, her speaking. Um, and last but not least, what you're doing with this entire uh, meeting here is, it's just, it's this challenge of humanizing this stuff. It's endless. So Nancy, I give you the last word. Sure. Well, Randy actually sent part of the inspiration for a lot of the things that I've done is a cartoon that Randy sent me a long time ago from the New Yorker. And it's got this guy sitting on a couch and he's holding his phone and he's talking to his friend. He says, and the caption of the cartoon is, making a difference doesn't make a difference. And to me, that's, <laughs> that's the... My, that's my sort of humor. Sorry. That's, <laughs> that's the essence of the problem with doom and gloom messaging. In fact, social scientists have known for decades uh, that just doom and gloom, uh, problem, huge problems without solutions, causes people to go to the bar. It doesn't cause them to do anything else positive. <laughs> and so on the one hand, we have the ineffectiveness of doom and gloom. Even with a good narrative, I would argue that doom and gloom has really reached its limit in terms of motivating people. People don't see what they can do. It's one of the things that's so cool about both of your stories is this, or the stories of what people can do. The second thing is that there are, as you will learn in the course of this weekend, so, so many account, examples of, of things that are, that do represent solutions, that are going in the right direction. Yes, not enough, as we heard in the opening session, but there are so many success stories out there, and this particular event over three days is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and then the final 
thing I would say, sort of looping back to this narrative structure, is that there isn't a conservation success on the planet that doesn't have an incredibly strong narrative structure to it. It begins with somebody recognizing a problem, the plastic on the beach in India, tormenting themselves, figuring out what they want to do, working harder, harder, obstacles, problems, and then resolving it successfully. If that isn't a story made in Hollywood or Madison Avenue, I don't know what is. So you guys need to tell your stories of success. Um, I, the last thing I'll say is that we really, as one of the things Ayana said at the opening, is we really need to um, widen the choir. Uh, conservationists have uh, often been accused of, of just speaking to each other and the choir being too narrow. We will have a lot larger choir out there if we start singing the song of success. Thank you. And with that note, thank you very much.